sectors. And um, last month we had um, a hospitality uh, presentation from CBRE's um, Hotel and Lodging Group and had a lot of great feedback. And so um, if you want access to that presentation, just reach out to us. But, um, but this month I'm super excited to welcome not only someone who I respect um, in the industry greatly um, and who's widely respected um, in the um, commercial real estate, particularly the retail industry, but also someone who I count as a close friend. Um, so Sam Latone is on the line with us. He is CEO of the Shopping Center Group. Uh, many of you, either direct through your bank or through your customers, have probably interfaced with the Shopping Center Group. They have 21 offices across the United States managing everything from um, leasing, landlord services, brokerage, investment sales, really all facets of, um, of the retail real estate sector. Um, so I um, count Sam as um, not only a close friend, but an expert in the space. And I'm really interested, um, selfishly, to hear from him today on what's going on in the retail space. I know we hear um, lots of things from lots of people that, um, that make the, the marketplace very crowded and, um, and confusing. But I think Sam's going to shed some light on, us, on, it, on it for us today. So without further, further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sam. Take it away. Well, Carl, thank you very much for that very kind and generous introduction. Uh, it's good to be here with all of you today. Um, and um, you know, as Carl said, uh, really going to present to you, you know, our perspective of the state of the retail real estate industry. And um, you know, I think contrary to popular popular belief and certainly what many of you see um, in the media, um, retail is not dead. Having said that, it is certainly going through a very significant form of evolution. And in the course of any evolution, you'll certainly see winners and losers. And I know there's been a lot of negative press during the first quarter of this year, um, you know, with a number of those losers highlighted. Um, having said that, um, I think it certainly deserves a much deeper dive to understand what's going on. And so that's what I hope to be able to achieve today. And we'll go through this presentation and then certainly be able to have a Q&A session afterward. Um, so it having, with that being said, let's start uh, with the supply side of the equation. Um, what you see here is an historical uh, bar chart that really kind of shows the trend in construction starts um, of retail broken down by the type of retail. Um, and not unexpectedly, you would see, you know, post uh, financial collapse, um, the significant decreases in the number of new construction starts. Um, I think a couple things that uh, I'd like to point out and take away from this chart, if you look at, you know, the various aspects of retail, um, we saw, you know, certainly 2013, 2014, 2015, a lot of that new development was driven, you know, really in one of two formats. Um, number one would be the neighborhood or community center that was primarily driven by um, the expansion of the grocery sector um, and, and grocers, not only new grocers penetrating um, um, new marketplaces, but also grocers, you know, really trying to expand their portfolios. Secondly, uh, we saw a lot of retail that was developed uh, as part of a mixed-use project, particularly driven by the expansion of multifamily. Um, I think the thing that's really interesting to note is if you look at this chart relative to 2015, um, 2015 saw a total of about 30 million square feet delivered na or, uh, construction starts nationally. Um, the data that we have through the third quarter of this year saw a very significant drop down to 9.7 million. Um, and we attribute that to a couple of different things. Number one, um, you know, certainly those of you that are in the lending community know that there's been real concern in the multifamily sector as to, you know, how potentially overbuilt or saturated it might be. Um, and that had a direct impact on the amount of new retail. Um, secondly, um, we saw traditional grocers, um, you know, really start to pull back some of their expansion. And, you know, all that taken together has made a really significant impact on the number of new construction starts in 2016. Um, on the demand side, you know, if you look at retailers, uh, you know, we kind of break it down between luxury discount um, and the middle class. Discount has been growing at a tremendous clip, and that's really driven by the value in bargain hunter. Um, luxury, on the other hand, uh, has been performing relatively well, 
However, we do see some headwinds as it relates to luxury as a result of, you know, certainly gateway markets across the U.S. that are heavily impacted by international tourism, and as a result of the rising dollar, that international tourism consumer um, and the uh, the driver of sales relative to luxury retail uh, is, is starting to show some, some chinks in that armor. Um, it's really the mid-price retailers that have been affected most um, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, first of all, during the recession, we saw a significant trade down effect, meaning that those that were more aspirational consumers that were really buying mid-price, particularly apparel, traded down to discount. Um, and that had a really permanent impact on mid-price apparel. Um, secondly, you know, if you look at what happened in the news during the first quarter of this year, um, a lot of those bankruptcies and store closures that we're seeing really were among that mid-priced, if you will, um, retail segment, which has been hit really, really hard and is yet to recover and really show no signs of recovering going forward. Um, you know, certainly we've seen those categories that are uh, most impacted um, and have seen some negative growth. And those are, you know, retailers that are shrinking footprints and are really um, heavily impacted by e-commerce. Categories like office supplies, consumer electronics, and butch stores. And then certainly negative or flat growth, um, you know, particularly, again, amongst those mid-price retailers and especially uh, in the grocery segment, um, those that are unionized. They can't necessarily compete from a cost structure perspective and are seeing their margins impacted in a very negative way. Um, in terms of those retailer categories that you know really are declining, um, you know if you look at these they're, they, they, they kind of fall into one of two different categories. Number one, they've either been entirely replaced or very negatively impacted by e-commerce. Or number two, they've failed to reinvent themselves in a way that really continues to resonate with the consumer. Um, next, I really want to talk about the uh, impact of key economic in indicators, uh, particularly as it relates to consumer expenditures. Um, so housing prices have been a tailwind. Uh, you know, we know that there's a direct correlation between housing prices and the associated wealth effect um, and consumer expenditures. Um, Statistically speaking, for every dollar of increase in home values, um, consumer expenditures increase by five cents. And if you look at a map across the U.S., we've seen some pretty healthy growth in year-over-year -year gains relative to the median home prices um, in you know the top 50 cities across the U.S. Um, fuel prices. So um, we characterize fuel prices again having a statistically significant impact on consumer expenditures. As a matter of fact, there is a 0.85 correlation between fuel price direction, fuel price direction, um, inverse correlation between fuel di price direction and consumer expenditures. Um, we say that the, the impact is, new, is neutral because although f uh, fuel prices have been down, we saw some creeping up last year. Um, and I think the consumer has kind of gotten used to the uh, price of oil at where it's been over the last 18 months. And although there was a significant impact early on, that impact has begun to kind of wane because the consumer has already built into their disposable income current fuel prices. Stock prices, you know, certainly been a tailwind, again, for the, for the result of that wealth effect. Um, you know, certainly we've seen a, a stock market that not only in 2016 was already trading at, you know, pretty much historical highs, but we've seen obviously a significant increase in uh, the value of the Dow since the first of the year. And that has a direct impact on consumer expenditures. Um, public policy, let's face it, no matter what side of the aisle on, it's really ugly out there. And that has a very negative impact on the consumer. And that uncertainty impacts consumer expenditures and the desire of the consumer to spend. Um, employment, we characterize it somewhere between neutral and a tailwind. And, and the reason why we say that is although from a unemployment perspective, the unemployment rate is sub 5%, um, we've seen very flat wage rates. And um, when we see this kind of trend in terms of wage rates, um, that has a negative impact that kind of offsets 
uh, the unemployment rate because the consumer is not experiencing wage rate growth in spite of the fact that the unemployment rate has been so low. Um, interest rates, uh, again, we look at that from a neutral impact perspective because although interest rates are low from an historical norm perspective, certainly there's expectations of rising interest rates. Um, and so we look at that as neutral relative to consumer expenditures. So let's talk about a little bit of, of, of good news. Um, if we look at retail closures, um, you know, you see some spikes over the last uh, couple of years. Most of those spikes have been concentrated um, in a couple of uh, retailers, two or three retailers who, you know, whose lifespan uh, really should have ended a long time ago. Um, you know, look at Radio Shack, which, uh, you know, rep which accounted for about 1,100 of the closures back in the uh, first quarter of 2015. Uh, Sports Authority, which closed 320 plus stores. Office Depot, which closed 300 stores. Um, you know, Wet Seal, Deb Shops, Body Central, all of which were um, retailers and brands that, you know, really no longer resonated with the consumer. And as a result of that, really suffer from enterprise value, more rent enterprise uh, uh, issues more than anything else. Um, retail bankruptcies, again, if you look at this chart, you know, we saw a peak in 2008. Um, 2016, it was the lowest we've seen uh, since 2007. Um, you know, certainly we've seen uh, some, some, some significant bankruptcies take place in the first quarter of this year. We expect to see that number in 2017 to be somewhat higher than 2016, but still, we don't see any kind of spike relative to what we saw uh, post-financial crisis in 2008-2009. That was a period in time in which, you know, we had Stephen Goodies, uh, Stephen Berry's, uh, Goodies, uh, Circuit City, Linens and Things, and a number of major retail chains that went out of business. Um, if we look at uh, planned openings, uh, we expect 2017 to see uh, uh, almost 45,000 new store openings across the U.S. What's happened, however, is that um, well, let me before before uh, before I get to that, um, the the other thing that's a positive trend is we're seeing the average ticket price across various categories of retail um, actually increase. So if you look at the chart on the, the the chart on the right, that represents the change relative to the average ticket in each of those various categories, um, and in total, it's about a 13.9 percent increase, which we think is very positive, in spite of the fact that the chart on the left, which represents you know more along the lines of foot traffic, foot traffic is down, and you know we'll, we'll talk about this more when we get to the e-commerce impact on retail, but although foot traffic is down, the average ticket price is up because at the end of the day, the consumer is going to a bricks and mortar store with purpose. And they're actually going not necessarily to browse, but more, uh, more uh, to, to, to actually buy. Um, demand shifted. Um, you know, this, this is really a, a uh, th th this bar chart I think is very uh, significant because as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the last 12 months, we saw about 40,000 new store openings. 30,000 of those, over 30,000 of those are in the restaurant category. Um, the fast casual concept has been growing at incredible rates. Um, and, and that actually has a negative impact, believe it or not, on grocery. Because people are choosing to eat out as opposed to, to going to the grocery store and cooking at home. So we talk about the grocery wars. Um, you know, if you look at the grocery segment, which represented a significant uh, uh, which experienced a significant period of growth between 2012 and 2015, um, we've begun to be concerned about the saturation. Uh, not only saturation, but also new players entering the marketplace. You know, for instance, many of you have probably heard about Lidl. Um, Lidl is a German grocer that is really designed to compete with Aldi. Um, and as a result of Lidl's entrance to the marketplace, all of these trying to figure out how to reposition itself to resonate more strongly with the consumer to maintain its market share. Um, also, the traditional grocer, 
uh, we think that the, trad the traditional grocer could potentially be most impacted by e-commerce, particularly Amazon's launching of Amazon uh, Fresh and Amazon to Go, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. I don't know if you all can hear this, but this is actually a video on Amazon to Go. Um, I think Carl's going to be sending out this uh, this presentation to all of you so you can actually see it. But this concept is really interesting uh, because of the fact not only is it a more convenience-oriented type of concept, but there's also really no personnel in the store. I'll just give this a minute to play through. I'm going to make the assumption that you all can't hear this because Carl and I were not able to hear it earlier. But basically what they're using is they're using RFID technology. And in, in effect, there's no cash registers, there's no checkouts. Um, the shopping basket gets automatically populated. And if you want to put something back, it automatically gets removed from your shopping basket. And then you just walk out the store and automatically charges a credit card on file. Now, Sam, are you are is this concept actively in the marketplace today, or is this just something in the future? The first store actually opened in um, in Seattle, um, and this is a concept that they are in the midst of beginning to launch. So this this is a concept for today. Very cool. Again, my, my apologies that y'all can't hear this, uh, but you will see the video when you get to a copy of this presentation. So that's the first location. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is, you know, what concepts are growing? And what I did is I broke it down into categories. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with a number of these, um, Top Golf, Dave & Buster's, um, theaters, uh, you know, think about theaters. I mean, you know, 10 years ago with, 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 uh, with On Demand, I think the entire theater industry, the perspective of the entire theater industry was, was it was not long for this world. And they really in, reinvented themselves. And when you look at the theater concept today, um, it's truly an experience, and they've created that experience that combines um, fine dining with a uh, experience of watching a movie that you can't get at home. And so by virtue of having reinvented themselves, the theater concept is not only alive and thriving, but it's also one that's in great demand in shopping environments because it really draws in the consumer in a pretty significant way. Um, Eatertainment. Um, I've got another video about a Starbucks concept uh, called Starbucks Reserve. Uh, it's actually the roastery concept. The first one's opened in Seattle. The second one is under construction um, in New York, actually in the Chelsea Marketplace area. And this is what I refer to as retail as theater. Um, and, 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 and these types of concepts create an incredible consumer experience and it creates a, a brand loyalty from the consumer. Um, because of how they experience the brand. Um, Eatertainment, uh, Joe the Juice, which is an incredible juice bar out on the West Coast. Um, uh, Punch Social Bowl, for those of you that live in the Southeast, if you've ever been to Nashville, there's actually um, just out in East Nashville a concept called Pinewood Social. That's very much like Punch Social Bowl, but basically it's it's um, it's bowling and more of an entertainment or in, in not a traditional bowling environment where they have you know sit down dinners, um, you know much higher quality food, um, and it's a gaming concept that revolves around bowling, uh, but again adds that entertainment concept where people are going there and having a great dinner and also having the experience of bowling. Um, Grocery, um, you know, again, I mentioned Lidl, Aldi, uh, Sprouts has really been trying to grow in a very significant way in the southeast. Uh, for those of you who experience Sprouts, Wegmans, which is the New York-based grocer, is coming south. Um, it's actually got its first store uh, under construction in North Carolina and Raleigh. Um, 
365 is the Whole Foods concept. They've got about a handful of those open. Um, one of the things that Whole Foods has begun to see experience, however, with the 365 concept it, is that it was designed um, to be a very different price point than a full line Whole Foods store and really resonate more with a millennial oriented type of population. Um, but what they found in the few that they've opened so far is that they're actually beginning to experience some cannibalization with the full line Whole Foods store. So as a result of that, they're trying to figure out the 365 concept and how it uh, combines to um, increase value for the chain overall, but not have a negative impact and cannibalize the full line Whole Foods store. So this is one of the concerns that I was talking about earlier when I was talking about the grocery wars. If you think about um, not only stratification of the consumer between Aldi on the one end and Whole Foods on the other one and in everyone in between, um, but also new entrants to the marketplace, which um, is creating additional saturation and competition and having negative uh, pressures on, on, on margins of grocers, which are already relatively thin because they work on a volume type of basis. Um, as I mentioned, restaurants. Uh, you know, r restaurants have been growing uh, at a very, very rapid pace. Um, pretty much all segments, particularly the fast casual. Um, the other aspect of restaurants that's been growing is celebrity chef type concepts. Um, and celebrity chefs that are actually um, anchoring, if you will, the food hall concept, many of which you've you, you know, many of which you've seen. So, for instance, there is a um, a project that we're working on in the Brooklyn area of New York that is going to be a food hall, but is oriented around Todd English, the chef. And Todd English will have a number of different concepts in the food hall. Um, so it's a food hall that's actually driven by the chef. Um, for those of you that are familiar with Nobu. Um, the, 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 the master sushi chef, um, the old Eden Rock Hotel in Miami Beach has been rebranded Nobu and it will have a flagship Nobu restaurant in it. So what's happening is a lot of these celebrity chefs are really trying to figure out how to use their brand um, and put it in a very different environment to increase brand awareness and increase customer experience. Um, fitness. Fitness has been a very significant growth uh, uh, growth category. Um, one of the things that we found is that um, LA Fitness and Lifetime, which are kind of the more traditional large format uh, fitness centers, although they've been growing um, very, very quickly um, and doing very, very well in terms of their new store openings, what we're seeing is the more the higher end consumer really wants more of a small format fitness experience. And so when you look at concepts like SoulCycle and Orange Theory, that provides that uh, more um, intimate experience that you know a number of customers are looking for. Um, and, and we've seen significant growth in the smaller format fitness concepts. Medical. It used to be, it's kind of funny, I remember 20 years ago, medical was listed as one of the Noxus use clauses in many anchor leases in traditional shopping center environments. Um, and today, um, medical is very prevalent in a traditional shopping center environment. Um, what we found is hospital systems have you know, really kind of redesigned their whole business model where the traditional hospital is where they're doing you know, significant procedures and surgeries and then um, they're using the, um, uh, the urgent care center in a traditional shopping center environment to really treat patients that have day-to-day -day issues like the common cold and flu. Um, e-tailers. Uh, this is really interesting because you know, for all the talk about e-commerce being the, de the death of, of, of retail, um, what, what we found, and if you look at the behemoth, which is Amazon, is that it's very difficult to make money in a pure, uh, in a pure play uh, e-commerce environment. Amazon's been in business in tw for 25 years and has yet to turn a real profit. It's one of the reasons why they're directing a lot of their energies beyond um, B2C, business to consumer, um, and, and beyond Amazon Prime to things like Amazon Web Services. Um, you know, Amazon Prime, one of the, one of the biggest 
uh, reasons why people subscribe to Amazon Prime is to be able to get Amazon Video and Amazon Movies and you know Amazon Original Series. Um, and what's happened now is we've seen pure play each uh, e-commerce retailers move into a bricks and mortar environment to really take the brand to the next level. Bonobos, for those of you who are may or may, may not be familiar with them, um, has historically been a pure online men's shop. Um, as Bonobos has started to open what they call the guide shops, their experience is really interesting. What they find is that the average consumer, when they go into a guide shop, purchase two times the amount of merchandise they do when they shop the online store. They come back to shop more frequently than they do the online store. And the returns, which are the bane of e-commerce retailers, um, ha ha are significantly less. Um, one of the issues facing Amazon and others is Amazon's experience with, uh, with shipping is that it's, it's increasing by an average of 40% a year. And when you factor that into the cost model, it becomes very difficult to make money in a pure e-commerce environment. Um, specialty, you know, uh, Lululemon, um, Zara, uh, Apple, uh, you know, the, the names all of you are familiar with. Um, you know, again, these, these are concepts that are experiencing um, significant growth and runway to expand their brands. Um, Apple, by way of example, you know, they went ahead and hit the top 25 markets and, you know, really had focused on, on what I'll call fortress malls. Um, at, but their next period of expansion is going to be focused beyond those top 25 markets and in many cases smaller markets because they see that they've established a brand that resonates so well with the consumer that they can go beyond traditional fortress malls and in many cases be in smaller markets and in more traditional shopping center environments. Um, Nike, for those of you that uh, spend any time in Miami, Mike, Nike op opened up recently a flag shop store on Lincoln Road in Miami. Um, and if you have time to go visit it, it's amazing. It's about a 35,000 square foot store with a mezzanine. Um, and you walk in and not only is the customer service off the charts because all the store associates are incredibly knowledgeable, but then they've got, <clears throat> um, um, they've got treadmills that are set up where you can actually try on the shoes that you want to run in, get on the treadmill and see how you like the shoes. They've got a second floor with a basketball court where if you're looking for a basketball shoes, you can go up and shoot hoops for a while and see how you like those shoes. Again, you'll, you'll keep hearing about embracing the customer through experience and retail theater um, and, and those retailers that are capable of doing that are going to be the winners as opposed to some of the losers we've been hearing about earlier this year. Um, household accessories, um, for those of you that are in Atlanta, uh, go to the flagship store, the Restoration Hardware flagship, flagship store on Peachtree. It's absolutely amazing. Um, big box and discount. You know, as I mentioned, you know, discount has been growing by leaps and bounds. Um, you know, we represent on the tenant representation side of our business, Ross Stress for Less, and they continue to grow and they continue to increase their market share. Um, you know, Nordstrom's real growth vehicle has been Nordstrom Rack, and their experience with Nordstrom Rack has been very, very solid. Um, PetSmart, you know. People's new children, particularly millennials, are their pets. Um, and, you know, a, a, a pet store has become basically a grocery store for pets and an animal hospital for pets, along with services like grooming, et cetera. And so by the reinvention of the pet store concept, PetSmart has really upped its game in a pretty significant way and allowed itself to really grow and resonate with the consumer and create incredible brand loyalty. So what does this all mean? Um, so when you take into consideration the construction start numbers that I showed you at the beginning, along with growth of retailers, one of the positive effects that we've seen is that retail GLA per capita, which, in, in the, which is high, amongst the highest in the world in the U.S., has been flat. It has actually begun the process of starting to trend down. And that's healthy for the industry overall from a competition and saturation perspective. Um, if we look at shopping center vacancies, um, they are lower today than we've seen them in a long time. 
I will tell you the couple things that I think are really interesting on this chart, um, and maybe are not necessarily reflected on this chart, but I'll point out, is that you know four years ago, the death of the power center was predicted. Well, what ended up happening is the power center reinvented itself, and you know a lot of those boxes that I mentioned followed bankruptcy back in 2009, 2010 were backfilled with those concepts that resonate really well with the consumer, meaning grocery, meaning um, uh, fitness, um, entertainment, theater, et cetera. And as a result of that, the power center um, really has morphed into more of a community center today as opposed to what it was you know, five, six, seven years ago. Um, mall vacancies, as you can see, is really kind of the second highest um, kind of amongst this breakdown. Um, but a lot of that is really a function of the B and C class malls and tertiary markets. According to ICSC, I think there's something like 1,220 malls around the U.S. Of those 12, 1,220 malls, the bottom 600, so about half, produce less than 25% uh, of total retail sales. So when you've got that type of performance, a lot of those malls you know, really need to go away um, and ultimately over time shouldn't be part of the inventory because they're no longer viable in a mall format. Um, e-commerce, um, and I think probably some of what you've heard is e-commerce represents about 10% of total retail sales. Um, interestingly enough, back in 1990, um, catalog sales represented 10% of total retail sales. So the, optimi the optimist in me would say that all e-commerce has done is replace what was once catalog sales, which are really non-existent today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not naive enough to say that that's the whole picture, but I think that's an interesting comparison when you look at what catalog sales were 25 years ago versus what online sales are today. Um, the other thing that I think that's really interesting is the top of the eight of the top ten fastest growing retailers, eight are actually traditional bricks and mortar retailers that are integrating a unified approach to their customer between e-commerce and mobile. Um, this is a breakdown by category. I think you know one of the things that I would take away from this is is, is a couple of different things. I, I think that you know first first of all. Um, uh, traditional grocer, traditional grocery has the potential to be impacted by e-commerce. Uh, kind of uh, an article that I read recently said that by the year 2030, um, e-commerce could represent 20% of total grocery sales in the traditional grocery format, um, which kind of leads you to really focus on the wings, if you will, of that, that stratification that I talked about earlier. Um, the other one that could potentially be impacted by e-commerce and has a lot of runway is actually auto parts. Um, you know, we saw auto part group, we saw, you know, the Pep Boys, um, you know, types of concepts grow very significantly. Um, AutoZone, um, you know, all those concepts grew very significantly, particularly in the midst of the recession when people were keeping onto their cars a lot longer. And as a result of that, those concepts grew very rapidly. Um, having said that, uh, we think that there's the potential for that category to um, meet significant impact uh, by e-commerce. Um, so here's here's kind of what what we're seeing as a significant change in the whole world of e-commerce. Um, you know, desktop purchases remain steady, but the new e-commerce is actually m-commerce. And what's happening is as a result of smart devices we're really beginning to see a blurring of the lines in terms of exactly where the purchase is taking place. Um, and the reason why I say that is because, by way of example, Best Buy, um, at this, during this past Christmas season, 40% of Best Buy's online sales actually originated in the store on a smartphone. So, you know, many re re retailers aren't consistent in terms of how they cat categorize that sale. So we're starting to look at the statistics of e-commerce relative to total sales, total retail sales, and we're really beginning to question those statistics because we no longer know where that per point of sale, um, how that point of sale was really count counted. 
when you go into, for instance, uh, um, a Ferragamo shoe store, okay, if they are out, of, if you see a shoe that you're looking for and they're out of your size, the store the store associate has a iPad. They'll order it and have it shipped to your house. So again, what's the origination of that purchase? Is that an e-commerce sale or is that a um, uh, is that an, a bricks and mortar sale? And not all retailers count those sales the same. So you know that that's an issue that we're trying to figure out how to deal with going forward. Um, this is a little bit more about mobile devices. Uh, according to In Reality, 75% of shoppers are using their mobile devices while in the store during the purchase process. Um, that's a huge number. And again, that, that further points to the issue of what's the point of sale. Is it a bricks and mortar sale um, or is it an e-commerce sale? Because customers are using um, the, the, uh, the, the customers are using the smartphone to shop online of, for that, that particular retailer's online portal while they're in the store. I've talked about um, you know, providing store associates uh, with, with mobile devices to assist the customer in the process. And again, the biggest example is where they're out of the product in the store and then the store associate orders it and ships it to, their, to the customer's house. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, this gets back to one of the things that I was talking about earlier as to the economics of e-commerce versus bricks and mortar. Um, retailers are really beginning to look at the customer acquisition cost. Um, and, and that customer acquisition cost is a real focus in operation circles. Um, and it really gets back to not only the item cost, but when you can get the customer in the store, there's a multiplier effect. And typically, when you can get the customer in the store and that customer is shopping both online and offline, you know, online and bricks and mortar, that multiplier effect is somewhere in the 3x neighborhood. So if a retailer can get a customer engaged both in their online and offline store, that customer will typically spend three times more than the customer that shops only one or the other medium. And then the other thing is, is, is returns and, and shipping costs. Um, you know, many of you are familiar with Zappos. Uh, Zappos is a, is a pure play e-commerce shoe retailer. Um, Zappos will, you'll, you'll pick a shoe and you, you might order five or six sizes in different colors, have them sent to your house, and not only is shipping free, but returns are free. So the customer will keep one and send the other four or five back. Think about what that does to the e to the economic economics of a pure play e-commerce retailer. Um, unified pricing policy. Um, so ma many of you are familiar with Bose. Uh, Bose is a manufacturer, and this is actually the same uh, same is true for high-end appliances as well, like Sub Zero, Wolf, etc. The manufacturer actually sets the price. So by virtue of the manufacturer um, setting the price, there is no cost differential when you buy that product online. Um, because what ends up happening is the only way the manufacturer will sell that to a distribution outlet or a retailer is if they agree to set that price, you, to, to sell it to the customer at that price set by the manufacturer. Um, I don't know if anybody, any of you might be familiar with a concept called Perch. Um, again, for those of you that may be here in Atlanta, there's a store in Buckhead, and Perch is a high-end um, um, high appliance and bath accessory, uh, kitchen and bath accessory uh, store. Um, so first of all, when you walk in the store, um, it's, it's almost like a Starbucks counter with baristas that are greeting you with coffee, flavored coffees. And as you walk around the store, um, they actually have full kitchens that are full working kitchens that are set up. Um, and it's all the brands that I just mentioned. And they're, the, the, the way they have created um, a very viable concept is because of the fact that those manufacturers have a unified, unified pricing policy. And so it's about the customer experience in the store because you can actually go in the store, they have chefs on staff, and those chefs will actually prepare a meal in that working kitchen and show you exactly how the, uh, how the meal uh, gets prepared during uh, in, inside the kitchen itself. 
you can go to the bath the 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 bath and shower area and you can actually make an appointment and go take a shower in that fifty thousand dollar shower that you want to install in your house um, so again it's using that unified pricing policy as a way to make themselves different um, than 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 others big data um, so some of you may have heard of Beacon concepts, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but retailers are really beginning to try and collect as much information on their customer as they possibly can. The idea is that they want to influence consumer that customer's behavior and influence their purchases. So by way of example, um, Target in Minneapolis. Um, they had an experience a little while back, and some of you may have read this in a Forbes article. It was actually in a Forbes article uh, where the, uh, a household had a Target credit card, and uh, dad kept going to a mailbox every day and finding that that Target store was sending them coupons for things like diapers and formula, all sorts of baby products. And one day he finally got really irritated about it. He called the store manager at Target and said, you know, Stop sending me all this stuff. Uh, you know, we're a household that only has one young daughter, uh, one uh, has, has uh, one child in it, and she's 16 years old. We don't need any of this stuff. Well, about two weeks later, he actually had to call the store manager and apologize. And the reason why he had to apologize is because it turned out his daughter was pregnant. And the way Target knew the daughter was pregnant is because they were running. They had a. They were actually running algorithms on Target credit cards. And based upon what was being purchased on those target credit cards, they could actually predict when something was happening like a woman was pregnant um, uh, in that household. Kind of scary stuff, kind of big brother stuff, but it, it, you know, retailers are using big data more and more as a way to influence uh, consumer behaviors and consumer purchases. Um, Best Buy, you, know, you go ahead and you buy a, a printer uh, they'll send you coupons for the printer cartridges when they're on sale. Beacon technology is something that is influencing the consumer while they're in the store. So, again, um, what it, what, there's, there's a video here. Let me get to it. There's a video here. This is a Macy's video, and unfortunately you can't hear it. But this is, all what, this is about what Beacon technology is. You actually opt in, and you share your preferences with the retailer and what happens is you're actually walking around the store the retailer will instantly give you instant coupons and actually direct you to the merchandise that you shop for the most I'm just gonna pause here for a second you know again I, I, I apologize if you can't actually hear the video but you can see some of the graphics and it kinda tells the story itself Hey Sam, I have, a, I have a question while this is running. Um, so yeah. In an earlier slide, you mentioned that 75% of the people in a retail store are are using their smartphone while they're there. Um, is there any? And I'm not sure if there is, but is there any way to track um, people going into a retail store, kind of trying stuff on, looking around, and then using their smartphone to price shop, and then they're leaving without purchasing? Is that a concern? So. That, that, that has been a concern, um, but what we have found actually is the opposite takes place. When a customer okay. wants to buy a particular product, what they'll do is they'll research before they go to the store. So they'll, they'll research who has that particular product to see who has the best price and the best selection, and they'll, use, they'll actually use Amazon as a way to price compare before they go to the store and actually shop. It's one of the reasons why one of the slides I also, also had earlier is although foot traffic is down, average tickets are up because the consumer is actually going to the store knowing exactly what they want, what price they're going to pay, and they're going there to actually make the purchase. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, DC versus online fulfillment. So uh, D DC is distribution center. So this is where... Um, retailers are using their, their bricks and mortar portfolio and they're turning what are, are considered to be liabilities into assets. Target, by way of example. 
Target is moving away from a distribution center freight fulfillment model. And in essence, what they're going to do is they're going to use their stores as their distribution facilities. And the reason they want to do that, Dix, has, Dix does the same thing, as does Macy's. The reason why they want to do that is because of the shipping cost thing that I talked about earlier. So if, if you go and you want to order something from Target online, Target's going to ship it from the store that's closest to your zip code. And at the end of the day, they can accomplish two things. Number one, it's speed of delivery, um, and they can get it to you much more quickly than if they shipped it from a distribution center three times time zones away. But more importantly, number two, those shipping costs are a lot less. And by virtue of speed of delivery and shipping costs being a lot less, they're basically turning liabilities into assets. And we see that trend moving more and more. Um, as, as retailers that have significant store footprints are able to utilize those as freight fulfillment centers as a competitive advantage. Um, so let's talk about millennials. You know, a, a lot of what we hear is that you know millennials are very different than any other generation. Um, they've never known a time when they haven't been connected electronically. Um, you know, they grew up on they grew up pretty much with, with smartphones and the internet. Um, and as a result of that, you know, there's a lot of talk that millennials will be the death of bricks and mortar. So, um, because they, that, they as a generation um, will, will focus on shopping online as opposed to a bricks and mortar store. Well, the question becomes, are current preferences permanent ones? And to answer that, you know, we can see, first of all, they're certainly the larger consumer, largest consumer group. Um, the interesting thing is Generation Z, which is the one that is behind the millennials, um, uh, surveys indicate that they, they actually prefer to shop in the store as opposed to online. Um, the other thing about millennials is we believe millennial purchasing patterns are really as a result of their current economic picture. Um, this chart is a stark reminder of what that economic picture is. So the median income of 18 to 30 year olds in 1990 was $36,000. In 2013, adjusted for inflation, it was $34,000. The median student debt in 1990 was less than $10,000. The median student debt in 2013 was $33,000. Now think about what that means as it relates to disposable income and decisions they're making and how that impacts their lifestyle choices. The first is that you know certainly they're living in smaller urban spaces because it's cheaper to do so. Um, but the other issue is they're marrying much later at life, and because they're marrying much later in life, traditional household formations aren't taking place yet, um, like they have in prior generations. So as you can see, in 2016, um, the average age of males for marrying was 32, the average ages for, for females was 30. Look at how this chart has spiked, um, particularly since 2000, you know, just before the recession is when it really, uh, it really started to spike and hasn't shown signs of tailing off yet. Um, so that millennial demographic is aging. In, in, in terms of its median age. Today, it's actually about 27 years old. Um, we believe as a result of that, what, it, what will happen is because you've got the combination of rent growth and urban environments, if you look at these rent growths, there's, you know, the, 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 where, where they typically live in a multifamily type of environment, in an apartment type of environment where they're renting, you know, look how quickly those rent growths are, are moving, particularly in a lot of these cities that you know, many, many millennials favor. Secondly, you look at this uh, top 10 one bedroom median rent prices. Um, you know, some of these numbers, again, are staggering. When you consider that in the context of their median incomes that I talked about a couple minutes ago being $33,000 a year. Having kids, you know, good, a good friend of mine said it best. You know, I, I can't predict what, what millennials would do as it relates to where they want to live, but I'll, I'll take my chances with biology. And biology means that when they have kids, they'll follow the best school, they'll want to move to the best school systems. And in most cities throughout the US, the, be, throughout the, US, the best school systems tend to be in the suburbs as opposed to in the inner cities. 
the X factor, um, baby boomers have $30 trillion of wealth that will ultimately be transferred to millennials. And when, when that transfer of wealth begins to take place, then that, that, that uh, financial, uh, that economic picture that we showed earlier um, has the potential to significantly improve and really change how they, how they live, work, and play. The other thing we're beginning to see is some, some wage rate rebound. Um, you know, I don't know what you all are seeing, you know, in, in your environments, but I can tell you, um, you know, we're a company today of about 220 people. And, you know, we're seeing that as we hire people, wage expectations are growing much more quickly than we've seen in the last several years. Um, so our experience are, is that we're seeing significant increase in wages, and I think that we'll start to see that be translated kind of across um, corporate America. So our conclusion is that current preferences are not necessarily permanent ones, and as a result of that, uh, the consumer be the, the behaviors of millennials will change as they continue to age, marry, and have children, and form traditional households. So some of the things that we're seeing over the next five years as it relates to bricks and mortar is that um, the consumer really wants knowledgeable store associates, those that can really help them through the purchase process, guide them through the purchase process, and also show them options through the purchase process. This was a, something done by BI Intelligence. I don't know if any of you all have ever uh, subscribed to that or seen that publication. But I thought this was kind of something that was very interesting. It said 54% of those surveyed indicated they're more likely to shop in a store that has knowledgeable store associates. You know, think about you know, those stores that you go into where you can't find anybody to talk to, and when you finally do find someone to talk to, they have no clue where to point you for what it is you're looking for. It's obviously a really frustrating thing to deal with, and certainly I can tell you from my perspective, I stay away from those kinds of those 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 stores. Um, it's about the experience, and you know, again, this is uh, let me get it up here. Uh, well, this one's not going to play. Um, you know, I, I talked about perch a few minutes ago. Um, you know, per, for for those that you have, have have not been in a perch, um, and if you've got one in the mar in the city that you live in, you you owe it to yourself to go visit one because I think it's a really incredible forward-looking concept. Um, Starbucks, as as I mentioned earlier, has a concept called the Roastery. The first one is is again in Seattle. The second one's opening in Chelsea Marketplace, and it's all about creating a customer experience such that that customer will be more loyal to the brand. Smaller stores, um, you know, I think candidly that's a healthy thing. You know, we saw the proliferation of, you know, huge large format stores. And at some point there's diminishing returns relative to store productivity. Um, so if we are in a situation where we've got smaller stores that are more highly productive, you know, I think that's healthy for the industry, uh, for the retail industry. It's also healthy, healthier for landlords because um, from a health ratio perspective, um, you know, when you look at a rent to sales ratio and you got more productive stores because they're smaller, um, that's a good thing for landlords uh, and lenders long term. Vertically integrated organizations. So there are a couple of companies and I'll point, I'll pick out one um, that was on the, the, the growth chart earlier, which is Zara. Um, Zara controls the entire um, manufacturing and distribution, design, manufacturing, and distribution process. And by virtue of controlling the entire design, manufacturing, and distribution process, they can deliver the product to the customer at a much cheaper price because they control, they have cost control through every, um, every element of the design and manufacturing pro and, and shipping process. And by virtue of having total, design, total control, there's a cost benefit to Zara as a retailer, number one. Number two, because of how they merchandise their stores, what they're doing is they're creating a sense of urgency with the customer because they only, they only um, manufacture um, limited amounts of any one SKU. And so if a customer goes in a store, they might only have that particular item 
in the store for two or three days and they're constantly refreshing the store with new merchandise to be able to keep it fresh and exciting for the consumer so the consumer is wanting to come back over and over and over again. Transparency of inventory information. So there are apps out there now where you can basically say you're looking for a coffee maker, you know, a particular coffee maker, and it'll tell you uh, what stores have it, how many they have in stock, and at what price. Um, and again, you know, that, that puts more power in the hands of consumers, but it also makes, uh, it, it, by virtue of putting more power in the hands of consumers, it's directing consumers to a particular store. Better understanding of who the customer is is the whole big data discussion that we had earlier. The more that the retailer can know about the customer, the better they can influence that customer's behavior and create more loyalty to that particular brand. A unified approach to retail. Um, so nothing is more frustrating where you have a retailer that has an online and an offline presence and it's like dealing with two different retailers. And those retailers that recognize that the customer wants to be able to shop in any medium they want to either acquire or return the merchandise will be best suited to capture that customer loyalty are the ones that are going to be the winners. And what I mean by that is if you purchase the item online, you want to be able to, uh, to return it back at the store. And, and actually, the retailer would prefer you return it back at the store because what they found is that typically when a return comes back to a store from an online purchase, typically that customer is purchasing you know, $1.50 for a dollar, every dollar of merchandise that they returned. Um, some of you have heard about uh, storage lockers uh, to pick up merchandise. You know, again, the idea being here that if you look at the various ways that the customer can get the merchandise, that has to be in the hands of the customer. The customer has to be able to acquire the merchandise in the way that's, that's best suited for that particular purchase. And by being able to um, provide these options, then again, that provides customer loyalty to that, to that particular brand. And at the end of the day, um, owners of real estate are actually starting to get into the game as well. So the five top mall owners, Simon, Matris, West, Simon, Macerich, Westfield, GGP, and Taubman, came together to provide seed capital to a company called Delive. And what's happening over time is Delive is being rolled out to all those malls, and it is also a option in the checkout, where when you check out, of a particular store, if you're in the mall, you can choose to have to live, uh, pick up your merchandise and send it to your house. Or conversely, if you are shopping at a particular um, store that's in that mall, to live will be a, uh, a checkout option where you can have the merchandise delivered to you from that store. Um, talked a little bit earlier about pure online retailers opening bricks and mortar locations. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing huge growth in this. Um, you know, the CEO of Warby Parker indicates that he sees them opening a thousand stores over the next five years. Um, Trunk Club, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Trunk Club, but Trunk Club, like Bonobos, was a pure online retailer uh, that has begun to open up stores. Um, you know, I think many of them see the experience of Apple and see what's happened to Apple from a uh, valuation perspective and from a customer um, experience and customer loyalty to perspective, and they're taking that lesson and they're applying it to their own companies. Um, the localization of retailers who purchase merchandise at the store level. Um, this might seem obvious, but particularly national chains. Um, a lot of them don't give the either the store or regional manager the ability to change what the buyers are purchasing for the entire store chain. Some of those that are great merchandisers do. Um, I'll use Ross Dress for Less as example. Um, in Miami, one of the best selling items for Ross Dress for Less are winter coats. And the reason why that's the case and so counter, although so counterintuitive is because you've got a lot of South Americans that are visiting Miami during the winter months of South America, 
and you know they get on a plane or you come from the north and you want to visit Miami when it's you know cold up in Minneapolis you get on that plane you fly down to Miami you have your vacation and when you're going back you see that you know in in St. Paul it's 32 degrees below zero but you can go to Ross and for 29.99 get yourself a winter coat so when you get off that plane and try and get to your car um, you know you're you're not you're not going to lose your toes Private label branded merchandise. Um, we're, we're seeing this increase in a pretty significant way. Um, I'm using Living Spaces, which is a West Coast furniture retailer, as an example of selling only private labeled merchandise. But if you look at a number of retailers, um, you know the private label aspect um, has really resonated with the consumer and, and, and taken off in a pretty big way. If you go to Saks, you can get a Saks men's suit. You go to Costco, you can get Kirkland's. Um, you know, the Kirkland Scotch is actually McAllen 12. Um, the Kirkland's Vodka is Grey Goose. So, you know, they're, they're, they're using that as a way to provide an additional offering to the consumer. Um, this is kind of an interesting one, um, and, and I'm going to talk about it in the context of traditional um, high end apartment stores. Um, Ten years ago, we most high-end department stores, you know, take it Saks, Neiman's, Lord and Taylor, uh, Nordstrom, had exclusive relation, had exclusive uh, uh, arrangements with designers that would only sell in their stores. And what happened over the years is those designers begun to realize that um, they may be better off to actually sell direct to the consumer than sell to the department stores themselves. And so as a result of that, a number of, brand, a number of designers that were traditionally exclusively sold in department stores now have significant bricks and mortar presences. Um, you know, think Burberry. You know, 15 years ago, the only place you could buy a Burberry coat was in a Saks or an Eamons. Today, you know, if you want to buy a Burberry coat, you're going to go to the Burberry store uh, because you want that experience of going to that Burberry store. Um, Sales tax issues kind of been on the table for a long time. Most states are taking care of it um, themselves, where uh, they'll collect taxes on online items. Um, having said that, you know ICSE its PAC is very, um, very engaged in trying to get federal law changed such that it's required that sales tax be collected in every online sale. So what are the takeaways? Um, I think first of all, for retailers, retailer demand that we've seen, um, and as, as Carl said, you know, part of our business is to represent retailers. We represent about 430 retailers today, exclusively in at least one or more of our markets. And I can tell you those retailers are focused on the best real estate. Um, you know, and, 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 and so we saw a point in time, uh, say between 2009 and 2013, where a lot of those retailers took it as an opportunity that were in, say, B or C class space to upgrade because of rent rent rates that you know kind of fell off the cliff pretty significantly during that time period, and their experience has been um, that the sales that they've been able to generate off of better quality real estate um, far outweighs the increase in the cost of the real estate to be able to be in those locations. Um, you see Class B demand um, in stronger markets, but you know the Class C space is really uh, for the local mom and pops and for those bottom feeders. Um, similarly, for property owners, again, it's a bifurcation of class. Um, you know, if we see we, what we've seen in terms of pricing on core assets, Class A assets, um, cap rates on on core Class A assets. You know, had have continued to trend down. You know, I think we've seen those bottom out. Um, but even if we see a increase in interest rates, which is certainly what's expected, most of the buyers of Class A real estate tend to be institutional, and they're all cash buyers. Um, and so the pricing of those assets will not be nearly effective, uh, affected as those assets that require leverage from a private buyer. Um, this is a kind of a chart, uh, and there's one that follows on Class A rent growth. 
um, you know, you can see kind of in these various markets across the country some pretty, you know, the, the ones that are in red are the ones that are seeing the highest amount of growth. Um, but even there's a lot of yellow on here, meaning 2 to 4% annual rent growth over the last couple of years. Um, and this is 2016, kind of similar, uh, where we're seeing some real, we've seen some really meaningful rent growth the last three or four years. So what does all this mean? What does it mean for the shopping center of the future? Um, and number one, um, we continue to see more service-oriented users in a traditional shopping center environment. Um, you know, uh, urgent care is a great example of that, that we talked about it earlier. Um, more mixed use. So for those of you in Atlanta that have gone to Avalon up in the suburbs uh, and up in Alpharetta, uh, that's an incredibly um, uh, successful project. And they did a great job of integrating, uh, they've, they've integrated retail, multifamily, single family, um, office, uh, and there will ultimately be a hotel there as well. Um, we're also seeing more blending of formats, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, for instance, uh, for those of you that are familiar with a project out in, in, in LA, in, uh, in LA called um, um, Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica, um, you'll see um, Juicy Couture, which is a really low-end, teen-oriented, price-point-driven um, apparel retailer right next door to Louis Vuitton. Um, and, and so that works because mom's going to Louis Vuitton and the 13-year-old you know, the, the, the daughter is going to Juicy Couture. Um, community focal points and gathering places. Uh, I think you know if you look at, again, I'll use the Avalon Project as, as an example. They're using a green space area for things like concerts, and during Christmas they'll they'll have an ice skating rink there. Again, it's a place to draw people um, as a way to really come and spend more time in a shopping center environment. And the more time they spend in a shopping center environment, the more they're going to spend. Um, trendy ca casual dining. Uh, so I, I mentioned, you know, the, the food hall in New York that we're working on that's really driven by uh, various forms of taught English concepts. Um, and more earth-forward-looking uh, focal points, um, you know, bike sharing stations, green spaces, you know, some land, some property owners might find it, that they're better off to take that one acre out parcel and as opposed to um, trying to sell it or lease it to a user, create a place where the consumer can come and gather and be more attracted to be in that shopping center environment, which at the end of the day, the goal is to enhance the sales of all retailers. And, you know, unfortunately, I think we saw a period of time that was driven in many respects by merchant developers and in some cases by some of the public and private REITs that were driven by FF&O, that as opposed to focusing on creating a great merchandising mix of retail in a shopping center environment, we're exclusively focused on maximizing rent on each individual space. And so for those property owners that understand the value of a great merchandising mix and how that can enhance sales of the entire shopping center environment, which ultimately will allow them to increase rents more significantly and more aggressively because of the sales that are being driven by those retailers in that shopping center environment, those will be the winners long term. And so with that, Carl, that's what I got. Awesome. Man, well, Sam, that was awesome. Uh, I can always tell um, how how great things are by how many people are staying until the the very end, and you yeah, everybody was um, listening and and sitting on the edge of the seat. So so appreciate that. I think for uh, you know my one of my takeaways, knowing knowing our clientele being community and regional banks, um, I think encouraging hearing the, uh, the 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 trending towards smaller stores and even credit tenant, tenants with smaller spaces. Um, you know, the neighborhood retail definitely, you know, location drives everything. So, um, so really appreciate you spending time with us. Um, for the folks on the call, uh, we will be sending out uh, both a recording of this um, so you can share it and uh, in the slides. Um, and, you know, for uh, if you ever need Sam or any help with uh, um, whether it's uh, landlord rep, say, on a um, REO property or, um, brokerage services, things like that. They are um, uh, definitely world-class and, and definitely friends of myself and Mountain Seed. 
so, uh, so we can get you contact information for them as well. But thanks a lot, Sam, and thanks everybody for listening in today. Thanks, Carl. <clears throat> Take care.